Wednesday, we begin the 10th chapter of the book of Isaiah of Yeshaya. And in um, the last chapter, there were prophecies of terrible devastation and destruction that was going to happen to the northern kingdom, to the kingdom of, of Israel, uh, as opposed to earlier in the chapter where we were told that God will protect the um, God will protect the Davidic dynasty, the city of Jerusalem, and they will have a son born, which according to many is the son born to them is, um, is a reference to his theology, except for Christians who say everything is a reference to Jesus. So without, uh, besides that, let us continue now chapter 10. Hoy, hachokukim chikikei even umistavim amal kitevu. Those who write out evil writings and compose terrible evil documents. La tot mi din dalim vil exol mishpat an ye ami liot almanot shlalam vi et yitomim yavozu. They subvert the cause of the poor. They rob the rights of the needy, of my own people, the widows, right? They, they steal from the widows. They take the shalal, the booty from the widows and also from the fatherless children, right? This is, these are questions to the, those who are writing the laws, the legislators who are giving great advantage to those who are already greatly advantaged. Umata pikuda. What will be your punishment, right? What are you going to do on that day, the day of punishment? When calamity comes from far away, who are you going to look for for help? Who's going to save your, your body? Who's going to save your, your honor? God's saying sort of nobody. From collapsing under the fellow prisoners, from falling beneath those who are already killed. And here, in yesterday's chapter, three times we had this phrase, and here we have it for a fourth time. Still, nevertheless, even with all the destruction and all the horrors, God's anger has not abated. His arm, his divine arm, is still outstretched. That Yadon Netuyan, as we pointed out multiple times in the previous chapter, right, evokes the image of the exodus from Egypt. This is the opposite of the exodus from Egypt. This is the destruction. God's arm and right hand were used in destroying the Egyptians. And now his arm and right hand, which is going to be, we'll see in a moment, the Assyrians are the ones who are doing that to the northern tribes. And that's where we continue, verse 5. Assyria, the rod of my anger, in whose hand as a staff is my fury. Right, They are the instrument for God to destroy B'nai Israel. Raises all sorts of questions of um, free will. Right? Is it their fault that they were doing this if God wants them to do this, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. We've heard it many times before. Uh, questions related to such an idea. I send him against an ungodly nation. I charge him to provoke, to go at my people, right? Because this is talking about them attacking B'nai Yisrael. They're going to take all the spoils. They're going to trample everything on the streets. But he has evil plans. His mind has evil designs. For he means to destroy, to wipe out nations, not a few. He's going to wipe out many nations. And so uh, who's this referring to? Those who say it's Sancheirev. There are those who say it's it's the king before uh, Sancheirev. Um, but what's interesting here, it's sort of like we just raised the question. I just mentioned it, right? The question of, the, uh, of free will with divine foreknowledge of God is telling you to do this. But what seems to be appearing from this second verse is, yeah, God's going to make them the uh, the rod of his anger against B'nai Israel. But the person who he's doing this to are, is already the executioners. It's already this violent army. So it's not as if he's taking the, you know, the peace-loving, um, I don't know, the peace-loving Hindus or whatever, and he's turning them into violent murderers. These are people who are already marauders, who already want to destroy. Ki Omar, in verse 8, Ki Omar, hello, Sarai, Yachtav, Milachim, because he's going to think, after all, I have kings as my captains, right? He's so great that, that, that people who in other places would be kings are just his captains. Hello, Kicharmish Kalu. No, Imloch, Arpad, Hamat, Imloch, Damesek, Shomron. Here it talks about all of the different places that the Assyrians have defeated. And why wouldn't they not be able to defeat Israel as, as well, right? Was Kalno any different from 
Charchamish or Hamat or Arpad or Samaria from Damascus, right? I could destroy all these places. Since I was able to seize these insignificant kingdoms whose images exceeded Jerusalem and Samaria's, right? These, these uh, kingdoms where there were more idols, I could take them and certainly I can take the kingdoms of Jerusalem and uh, and Samaria. That's what he is. That's what he is uh, opining and, and stay, saying here. Hello, Kashir Asiti Le Shomron Le Kena Sel Yerushalayim Ula Atzbeha. Shall I not do Jerusalem and her images? What I did to Samaria and her idols. It's worth pointing out here. This is happening. This prophecy. We go back all the way to chapter. Eight, I believe it was, where this prophecy began, and it was in the time of Ahaz. Ahaz was a wicked king, and Ahaz placed idols in the Beit Hamikdash. When we learned about his son Hizkiyahu, who replaces those idols in the Book of Melachim, uh, we talked about how it's it's almost like it was like a first temple Hanukkah. How he comes and he destroys all of the idolatry, removes it from the temple. It's kind of like the way we think of the holiday of, of Hanukkah. And so it, it, Jerusalem is a place also of idols. Continuing in verse 12. But when all of the king's purposes have been carried out in, in, uh, on Hartzion, in Zion, and in Jerusalem, then the arrogance of the king of Assyria will be punished, right? He thinks he's doing it because of his own might. He doesn't realize that he's just the rod of my anger. And because of his tiferet, because of his uh, you know, um, self-absorbed haughtiness and arrogance and believing that he's doing everything he's going to, he's going to uh, lose in the end. And that's the, uh, we've, that's the battle during the, it's not the battle, that's when the, Enemies of of uh, uh, of Israel, the the soldiers of Sancher of the Assyrians are um, outside of Jerusalem laying siege, and they get scared one night and they run away. And tens of thousands, I think the number given in the in the Book of Kings is one hundred eighty thousand of them get killed, and Sancher himself gets killed, right? And what is what is Sancher and what are these other uh, um, warriors uh, of the Assyrians saying? Verse thirteen. Right? What do they think, these Assyrians? Through might of my hand, I did this. It was my skill. It was my cleverness. I've destroyed the uh, the borders of people. I've plundered their treasures. I've exiled their vast populations. And this uh, this thing here, we talked about Gvlot Amin, was something we talked about in the past uh, with the um, population transfer. Right, The Jews of the Northern Kingdom were moved and sort of disappeared. And in their place, these uh, Sumerians, Later known as the uh, the Samaritans, were placed into uh, Israel, and we talked about that also back in the Book of Kings. But Timsaki Kenya di lechel amim uchasop beitzim as uvod kolar etzani asafti v'lo haya no date kanafu for except ha umisafti. I was able to seize them, like a. I was able to seize them, uh, like a, like a nest. Right, it was easy for me. It was just like uh, taking birds out of a nest. That's how easy it was for me to seize this, the, these people as one gathers abandoned eggs. So I gathered all the earth, right? Does an ax boast over the one who use with it? Or does a saw make think it's so great because the one who wields it? as though the rod raised one who lifts it, as though the staff lifted the person, right? This is what God is saying. You're just the ax. You're just the saw. You're just the rod. I am the person who's swinging it. It's not the rod themselves. It's I, God, saying I am the, I am the one who is, who is allowing the ax, the rod, in this case, you, Assyria. It is not through your cleverness. It's not through your might. It's because I'm allowing this to happen because I want B'nai Yisrael to suffer because they have rebelled against me. Therefore, write to God, the Lord of hosts will send a wasting away. Right? Your body will burn like fire, will destroy flesh, and you will be like an invalid who pines away. You will have nothing. And yet here God shows his um, relationship with Israel remains, the light of Israel will be a fire and its holy one, meaning God, will be its flame. So B'nai Israel, you think that it, it's going to be destroyed? No, 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 it's still a fire and a fire uh, can can continue to, 
to light, and that's what Bnei Yisrael are going to be. And will burn and consume its thorns and its thistles in a single day. And that's, again, the reference to the miracle where the Assyrians run away from Jerusalem, terrified. And the mass and its scrubs and its farmland, the trees will remain uh, scrubbed, and so few, uh, there'll be so few of them that a child's going to have to record what is happening because all of the adults, all of the soldiers will die. And on that day, the Sha'ar Yisrael, right? If you remember back in the beginning of these prophecies, the first of uh, uh, when Acha, when uh, Yishai was call, told to go and talk to Achaz, he went with his son Sha'ar Yashuv, that a remnant will return. Right? We're going to tell you prophecies of horror, but his, the, the name of his son is to symbolize that B'nai Israel will not die forever. There will be a remnant who return. And we have similar language here. Sha'ar Yisrael, the remnant of Israel, those who escaped from the house of Jacob, they will no longer rely upon their enemies. They will rely only upon God. And we've said that that's one of the themes of these chapters that Yeshaya is saying, don't trust, don't, the Assyrians aren't going to be the ones that help you. Right? If uh, Going back, the, the Three chapters or so, it is due to Aram and the northern kingdom attacking the, the Davidic dynasty, the kingdom of Jerusalem, of, of Yehuda, that Yehuda asked the Assyrians to help him. And they rely upon the Assyrians, and later the Assyrians become their enemies, and they try to rely upon the Egyptians. And all throughout this process, Yeshai says to them over and over again, don't rely upon them. They're like reeds. They, you think they're cedars, they're reeds, they're going to be knocked over. The only thing you can rely upon is God. And of course, back in the book of Kings, the king who does rely upon God, who is his Kiahu, it is during his reign that the Assyrians have to run away. Continuing in verse 21, in the same thing, Sha'ar Yashuv, Sha'ar Yaakov, El El Gibor. Only a remnant shall remain, a remnant of Jacob to the mighty God. And these words, El Gibor, were part of the name, presumably, of the fourth son of uh, uh, in the symbolism, which seems to be a response, uh, was unclear in last, yesterday's chapter if it was El Gibor was part of the name of Chizkiyahu that God was sort of giving him, or was God w- was the um, description of God that was giving giving the name Sar Shalom to Chizkiyahu. But either way, we see that the names that these children are supposed to have are symbolizing what is going to happen. Continuing twenty-two, because even if Bnei Yisrael shall be as the sands of the sea, right? You think you're so many now, this destruction is going to happen, and only a remnant of it shall return. It destruction will happen. Retribution comes like a flood, and we talked about that in the last couple of chapters, two chapters ago. The image of Assyria was the flood. That was that was a sort of uh, flooding and overpowering Israel. In yesterday's chapter, the image was used was them as a fire burning everything. It's going to be so bad, almost the way I understand this is both of the opposites. Both the both right. God is saying that's the the water and the fire. It's going to be such destruction. Because God is carrying out His decree of destruction, and unfortunately, only a remnant is going to return. Is this talking about Hiskyo? There are others who say maybe this is talking about the beginning of the Second Temple period, following the true destruction, the, the real destruction of the Beit HaMegash, when only a remnant, only about 42,000 uh, uh, people come back from Babel. The rest of the of the uh, people stay in Babylon. Continuing 24. So don't worry, my people who are in, who are in Zion, in Jerusalem, right? Don't feel the, fear the Assyrians. Right? Don't fear their staff like you did the Egyptians back at the time of Yitziat Mitzrayim. For very soon, my wrath will spent itself. My anger will, be, will was bent on wasting them. And then the Lord of hosts, God, Right? We said over and over again in these chapters, it's Hashem Tzva'ot, like the word Saba, the army, the Lord of hosts, will destroy Assyria as he did with Midian, with the, at the rock of Orev. And what that is we're talking about is all the way back in the book of Shoftim, Gidon, Yerubaal, was the one who led the battles against the Midianites, 
and O'Rave was one of the places where the battles happened. And uh, so just like that was a great miracle. If you remember that battle, uh, Gidon had gathered a lot of soldiers and God said, no, no, I don't want a lot of soldiers. And, and almost everybody was sent away. And there were only 300 men went with Gidon and they were very, they, they defeated the Midianites, routed them completely. So we're saying, God is saying here, it's going to be a great miracle like that. In that day, your burden shall drop from your back and the yoke from your neck. The yoke shall be destroyed because of the richness, because of the fatness. You will no longer have that horrors on top of you. You will be free. He who advanced upon Aeth, who proceeds to Migron at Mikmas, he de de deposited, he left his, his stuff there. They made the crossing Gevas in our way. Ramah was scared. The, the place of Shaul were, were terrified. And this is talking about the Assyrians, presumably, coming down the, 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 the uh, path that they took in the destruction of, of Israel. And everybody's scared. Sahali kolech bakalim, Anatot. Give a cry, those in Bakalim. Uh, you know, be careful, those in Lachish. You should be crying in Anatot. Menma ran away. The dwellers of Gavim, they, they sought refuge. Od Hayom Benovla Amod. You know, Faith Yado Har, Bat Sion, give At Yerushalayim. The same day of Nov, he shall stand and wave his hand uh, 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 towards Jerusalem, towards Israel. And here, actually, 32 starts. I forget which uh, which uh, haftorah it is, uh, but this is a, a, a haftorah starts here because this is where we start to get into again more um, moving away from the destruction towards um, chapter with a messianic vision, which is chapter 11. And so we're moving from that day of no, from that day of horrors, into now a uh, prophecy of um, a prophecy uh, of uh, of a dream and a hope. And it's one of the places where we see the difference between the chapters and the way that uh, the rabbis separated um, uh, separated the, the the book. That day, God, right, will you off the tree crowns with an axe. The tall ones shall be felled. The lofty ones cut down. Right, the Assyrians who think they're so great, they're going to be cut down. The thick. Forest, the thickets of the forest will be packed away with iron, and the Lebanon trees shall fall in their majesty. The ones who are coming from north, from the Lebanon, not that the Assyrians were in Lebanon, but they're coming from a northwest, northeasterly uh, way. And so it's it's from places where there are more cedar trees, and the the, the, the Arze Lebanon represent the idea of, um, of greatness and therefore haughtiness. God is saying, I am going to knock them down, I am going to destroy those things.